everyone, and welcome to the Passport to Peru lecture series. My name is Kiernan, and I will be your host on behalf of Peru for Less and Inca Expert Travel. Today's lecture is focused on the mystic motifs of the ancient Andes with our expert, Samantha Encalada. I firstly would like to thank everyone for tuning in today on Zoom and Facebook Live. We are so happy you could join us tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you know how to participate in today's event. Ms. Encolado will be answering some questions from the audience after her lecture, and please feel free to submit questions for her at any time during the presentation. For those joining on Zoom, just enter your questions into the Zoom Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom browser. For those on Facebook, just leave your questions in the comments section of the live stream. We are so pleased to welcome Samantha Encolada, the Director of Institutional Relations at the Arco Museum. Today, Samantha will showcase the intimate bond that existed between pre-Columbian societies and the natural world. She will explore this relationship through the motifs they left behind, weaving 5,000 years of history and artifacts from the museum's collection into a beautiful story. With a background in archaeology, Samantha found a passion for tourism and now works to bridge the two sectors. Hi, Samantha. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Hi, Kieran, and I'm doing well. So happy to be here. Thank you for having me, and thank you all for attending this. Yes, thank you so much for joining. We're so happy that you could be here. And before we get started, I was hoping that you could tell our audience what your favorite part about working for the Larco Museum is. Oh, wow. Well, you've seen it. You've been on the tour with me. So you know that the grounds are just amazing to begin with. So it's always nice to go to work on, on a place as beautiful as that. It just gives you a nice breather from let's say chaos of Lima. <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, and it's also magical, you know, to be able to see all of the people who go there and really are able to see and understand what, where we're coming from, how you're able to see the story of ancient Peru in such a lovely way that it really gives them the excitement that they need to go forward with their travels to Peru. So it's always beautiful to see that. I completely agree. The Museo Larco is one of my favorite places in Lima and something I recommend everyone to check out whenever they come here, especially especially the a great way to start your trip as well. Well, um, before I pass the mic over to you, I do want to remind everyone that they can submit your questions into um, either the Facebook live stream comment section or the Zoom Q&A at any time during the presentation, and we'll have about 15 minutes to answer some questions after the lecture. Well, thanks again, everyone, and off to you, Sam. Thank you. So now I'm going to show you, well, as Kiernan mentioned, uh, just wanted to introduce myself again. My name is Samantha Encalada. I am the head of institutional affairs at Museo Largo. It's a pre-Columbian museum um, in Lima, Peru. So the lecture today is about mystical motives of ancient Peru. But just a disclaimer, I know that this lecture is quite short, so uh, bear with me that uh, I won't be talking about all of the motives. You will have to come to Peru for that. But I did want to show you a little bit of the work that we do at the Museum of really communicating what is important for us that you are able to see while you come to Peru, the story of ancient Peru. We always say that we're like a gateway to ancient Peru. So it's always nice to think about it that way. But we'll start slowly. We'll start with the Incas, which is probably the starting point for most people, really. The Incas were a big empire, a quite popular empire. But it's a surprise to a lot of people to know that the Incas as an empire lasted for a little over 100 years. So why are they so famous? In 1532, the Spanish conquistadores arrived to what is now Peru, and they encountered the Incas. So they wrote about their customs and their traditions and their way of seeing the world. That was the interaction that they had. And so they wrote the Spanish Chronicles. And I would argue that that is the reason why so many people think about it. Peru and think about the Incas, because those Spanish chronicles really dictated everything that they thought about them and everything that they saw that was different from them. And these lasted for so long because they were written here by Spanish people and they, they went to Europe, to Spain and then Europe and then the rest of the world. And so for so many hundred years, because archaeology did not exist, 
right then. So for so many hundred years, let's say 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, we thought about Peru as the Inca. Everything that existed before the Spanish were the Incas. And so it wasn't really until the 20th century when archeology span began in Peru and so many pioneers of Peruvian archeology span started discovering way more than meets the eye. Now I like this picture and I wanted to show you it because uh, the, the person in the middle is actually Rafael Larco Hoyle, that is the founder of, the, of Museo Larco. So him and so many other fathers and mothers of Peruvian archeology span discovered a lot of different cultures that had such a distinct style that they could be able to be separated from the Incas. And so our perception of Peruvian history changed. We didn't see the Incas anymore as just this one thing that was conquered by the Spanish. We saw way beyond that and we are still discovering things because archaeology is young in Peru. So that's the most exciting part for all of us who are interested in history and archaeology. We see so many different cultures with different styles, with different centers, um, with different regions and places as centers and a different way of sort of different way of seeing the world, right? Now, I wanted to show you this, but this is really not all of the cultures that exist in ancient Peru. It's just so many of them. But the most important thing with this is that until now, we now know that Peru has more history than the Incas. We have actually over 8,000 years of history. And it's not only that, it's not only how much, uh, how old we are as a civilization. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the term cradle of civilization, but cradles of civilization are basically places where civilization started and developed in an individual way and for so, for so long, for such a long time. You might know some other cradles of civilization of the world, like for example, Egypt or Mesopotamia, India, China, Closer to us, it's Mesoamerica. And we now know that Peru is one of the oldest cradles of civilization. And beyond how old we are as a civilization and beyond the fact that we are a cradle of civilization, if you look at the map, we are actually the only cradle of civilization that existed in the Southern hemisphere as opposed to the Northern hemisphere. So that means that we used a different calendar and we had a different atmosphere really to develop that civilization. And Peru as a country has the pride, we, we always take pride of being so diverse. The, the, the biodiversity here is unbelievable. We have 84 of the 117 life zones in the world. We are cut by the Andes, we have a rainforest, we have a very dry coast that is also fertile because of the rivers that come in, and we have a very rich um, ocean. So that creates a lot of different regions. That means a lot of different ecosystems that the civilization started developing on. And that's what created so many different cultures and therefore so many different expressions that we can see. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about, what we see. Because um, ancient Peruvians did not have a writing system the way that we know it. And so the only way that we can talk and think about their lifestyle and their way of seeing the world that we call the Andean Cosmovision is by seeing the objects. When you see them in an exhibition gallery, sometimes it can take away from the places you see them in real life. That is temples and tombs and houses that existed thousands of years ago. So we are very careful at Museo Alarco to try and help you guide, um, help guide you through a more personal way of seeing these people. These were people that lived in, in an older time than us, and they had a different way of seeing the world. And if we don't understand that way of seeing the world, we're not gonna be able to 
form a connection to the objects that we see in the museum. And therefore, you won't be able to enjoy Peru as much. And that's what happens with most ancient civilizations and most cultural destinations, really. So we have to really understand the Andean cosmovision, the way of seeing the world and the symbols that surround them, at least the main symbols that I'm gonna talk about here. We need to understand them because we are so different from them now. This is where we live in. We live in a consumer society. I'm, I'm guessing not a lot of us have had to work in agriculture or being able to grow whatever we eat on the day and survive that way. We have a chain of production and therefore we end up eating things that we buy at a supermarket or at a market or at your local store. And so we are not aware of how much the earth needs in order to produce what we need to survive. That's not what happened 5,000 years ago. That's not what was happening. There were agricultural societies that really depended on their own labor and depended specifically on the cycles of nature. They needed to maintain a balance between all of the different atmospherical events and all of the different things that existed in their environment in order to survive. And that creates a mindset, a very specific mindset. So the main thing that is um, similar between all of these cultures is their perception of the world itself. You have a land, right? You have a land that you live in, but you have something that's growing underneath you. Those are the roots and all of the, the beginnings of your fruits and vegetables. And then you have the world on top where you have the sun and the moon and the stars and all of the things that create the cycle or the, of the calendar year. So let's talk about uh, the world above or Hanan Pacha in Quechua. The Hanan Pacha is the world of the sky. In simple terms, is where all of these things are that you can you, that you can see, but you cannot reach. And so it makes sense that in so many societies, including ours, we would think of these objects or as uh, as gods, or there would be people there or gods there that would move these objects forward. If you know what I mean, in different civilizations, you always have that, uh, you, you, you have that uh, phenomenon. You have the sun god or you have a god that moves the sun, right? So it's not, the, it's the same here. You have the world above. And of course, if you try to make a symbol out of it, you're going to end up discovering animals because animals are quite simple to really depict and it's easy to create and uh, to make up an animal that will symbolize that world above. Of course, I'm talking about birds. Now, the birds are going to be able to change because we are talking in very general terms. And again, we are very biodiverse. So we're going to have different kinds of birds symbolize different kinds of regions and different kinds of cultures. But their ability to fly and to reach the places where we cannot make them perfect to symbolize the world above. And then we have the complete opposite, and that's gonna be important later on. But the complete opposite is not where we are, it's actually what's underneath us. That's the world below, the Ukupacha. So the world below is so important because it's so full of life and it's the beginning of life and death, really. If you think about the earth, you think about how in an agricultural societies, you put a seed in and you will watch something grow out of the earth. There is such a great possibility of things growing inside of that earth. It's almost like a womb. It's also, and, and the, the comparison doesn't really stop there. It's wet and it's dark and it's warm. It's, it's a womb. So you put, you put a seed and you'll watch it grow. And oddly enough, we put all of our dead people there. So if you put something there, won't you watch it grow too? And that's the idea that we have of ancestors. These people that we ended up 
um, burying inside and become alive. They live in the Ucupacha. So what you see here is a vessel filled with ancestors that are living in the Ucupacha. The, the cycle of life kind of continues there. If you think about the world below and that power that has to regenerate itself, you think about snakes. Snakes and other reptiles, really. But the snakes have this ability, always kind of, kind of like a cycle, right? And they always change their skin. So it's a, it's a nice way to symbolize the way that um, the cycle can be reinstated over and over again. And then you have us. We are the world of now, because it's a little bit more complicated than just going up down the middle. It's the Caipacha. We live in the middle of the proverbial sandwich of our existence. And it's our job to keep everything balanced, to make the offerings that we need in order to continue the cycles in the world above and the world below so we can continue to exist, really. So that's represented by felines because they are the strongest animal that we have, at least here in the Andes, we used to have pumas and we also have jaguars near the rainforest. So all, both animals are going to be very comparable to us being strong, especially the people from uh, from the elites and the governors are going to identify a lot with the fangs of the feline, for example. So all of these worlds kind of combined create a balance. They create a, the power to continue the cycles for us to continue on living. Just to freshen up, you have the Hanan Pacha, the Kai Pacha, and the Uku Pacha. And they all exist kind of in this ladder because ladders are nice to go up and down and to interact with the world. So we are never alone, really. We are always interacting, whether it's offerings to the world above or offerings to the world below or maintaining the life as it is. This is a very, very nice example. I just wanted to bring it up because it's one of my favorite vessels at the museum. It's a mochica vessel. Now, um, it's a culture from, uh, from the northern coast of Peru. And if you take a first look at it, you're going to see that it's an animal. It's a moon animal, as we call it. You will see that it has the fangs. But if you look at the eye and see it from the other way around, you'll also see the beak of the bird that is there. You have some evocations of the snake in the way that the spirals are going. And you will also have the steps that can uh, that take you to other different worlds. So it's a very, very nice and lovely way to really synthesize what I've been saying about these symbols. Now, there's another thing that I did not mention, but it's the most simple thing, really, of what we need to understand about how these um, societies connected with their nature, and that's duality. Duality is a simple concept because it requires just thinking about the balance of things. If you know about the yin and the yang, you definitely know about the duality, how everything has its opposite that is also complementary, that happens in nature, that happens within us, that happens in our relationships too, because you have to be, uh, you have to reciprocate things. So you will constantly be seeing dualities, not just in the philosophical concept kind of way, very abstract, but you will see them the way that you see this vessel. You will see complete opposites that melt together in one object. This is a more powerful object, even because this. Um, this object is specifically made of gold and silver. Now, gold and silver are really beautiful as materials, but they're also very powerful because they evoke the shine of the sun and the moon, also oppos opposites. And not only opposites, but they live in that world above, right? 
So they represent a very nice meld together of that duality concept. And you will see it in a lot of different objects too. Other kind of metal work will include ornaments and, um, and different kinds of symbols, the symbols that we already saw, whether it's the spiral of the cycle of life that I showed you even without mentioning it, the animals that meld together with human faces um, in masks, in ornaments, in jewelry. And of course, we have things like this that not only evoke to the symbolism of the gold itself, but we have the aesthetic of having such a powerful, beautiful object in front of us. Every object that we have has more than meets the eye. So even if you look at an object like this, or if you go to Machu Picchu, that is the peak point of every single trip to Peru. Now everyone has it on their bucket list, I'm guessing, if you haven't been there yet. Machu Picchu is a magical place, and this is a magical piece too. And if you see them as they really are, and you see the backstory that is behind it, the motives and the story and the way of life that got us there, then we will be able to really enjoy more um, the way that we are introduced to, the, to Peru. When you see an object in a museum, you will see just maybe one and you will interact with it and you will form a connection with it. But if you think about the thousands of years and the thousands of, ob of objects and archeological sites and places that haven't even been discovered yet, you will understand that it takes more than a trip to Peru to really understand ancient Peru. So we invite you, I invite you personally to Museo El Arco and I invite you to visit Peru. I invite you to take in the, be the, the beauty of ancient Peru in a nice setting too and to understand that it doesn't take a history lesson to enjoy ancient Peru and that history lessons don't have to be boring because it's really just, it's, it's not a history, it's a story. It's the story of us and not us as Peruvians, but as a civilization and as humankind, which is beautiful to see. So hopefully I was able to show you a little bit about the symbols of ancient Peru and how you will be able to use them and to see them when you come to Peru. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for being here. Sam, thank you so much for sharing that wonderful knowledge about pre-Columbian Peru with us. It was so wonderful to be able to absorb some of that from you. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, but before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that if you would like to submit a question, there's still time to do so. Just use the Facebook comment section of the live stream or the Zoom Q&A feature. Um, our first question um, was from Tom Sheeran, and he was asking kind of in the middle of your lecture about some of the um, artifacts that you were talking about, asking if the stirrup pots can be lifted or carried. Um, Yes. Of course, they can be lifted. They can also be used. There's actually, um, there's actually, we don't really know about a lot of these objects. Unfortunately, at the beginning of archeological investigation, a lot of these objects, we didn't really have knowledge of being able to see what was inside of the pots. So we've lost it because they've been washed or you know, uh, cleaned in a way that we don't have that evidence anymore. But there is some evidence of having liquids inside of them. So of course they have been used um, in a ceremonial way. Let's, um, I, I forgot to mention this. Well, I didn't really have, <laughs> I, I had too many things to mention, but um, a lot of these objects were found in tombs. So they were probably used in a ceremonial way and then buried along with the owner or made specifically for them. We don't know how, uh, what the percentage is, but you can actually carry them. 
<laughs> you can oh, definitely wow. carry them. I've been able to hold one, so yes. Wow, that's amazing. And that's really interesting mm -hmm. to think about what kinds of things that were that they were used for in the past as well. And you know, some mysteries we'll just never know. Um, another question that we have um, from an anonymous member would like to know if the proximity of the Amazon rainforest had any influence on the Andean cosmovision or worldview. Oh, that's that's an excellent question. I mean, just by the concept of calling it Andean cosmovision, we forget that and when we think about the Andean area, we're not talking about just the Andes. We're talking about every region and countries that really form part of uh, the Andes, the Andean mountain chain. The rainforest, of course, had influence. They had their own ecosystem, but the way of having that connection to nature and using animals that existed near them really did influence it. And even on the material level, there are some cultures that really recognize the um, I mean, the, I mean, just the, let's say just the beauty, but really the, the symbolism behind having um, di different colored birds, for example. Um, mm -hmm. We have a beautiful, beautiful textile that it's made out of, um, that it's made out of feathers that are blue and yellow, you know, that only exists in the rainforest. So there was a constant interaction. I mean, jaguars were the equivalent of the pumas there. So, um, so for sure, there was a connection. We don't know what came first, like the proverbial egg, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, definitely. Wonderful. That's really interesting. Another question we have is, um, so uh, Lisa would like to know, what are most of these objects made out of clay, wooden, or, or some other kind of material? Um, I know that metal was also used. Most of, that's, <laughs> that's a very general question. <laughs> Now, it really depends on the culture. At the museum, we usually have mostly pottery, but you have to understand that that's also because that's the that's a material that will that will stick through time better. Um, we know that there were a lot of textiles being made um, that were lost because we have, especially in the coast, we have the El Nino phenomenon. And that brings up a lot of floods and therefore water that seeps into the earth and of course destroys organic materials. And we also had some jewelry that as we know, maybe could have left our country, you know? So, um, and, and wood, of course, it's also an organic material that, we're, that will deteriorate a lot faster. So mostly pottery, but let's say that the percentage of the other materials are more than what we would see in a museum. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, that's a really good point you make about our organic materials and environmental factors that allow for some artifacts to be preserved for longer than others. Another question we have is, uh, Michael would like to know, what is the most interesting, lesser known archeological site that you have been to? No, <laughs> I'm going to break some hearts with this one. Now, I haven't been able to visit a lot of archaeological sites. Um, I mean, not not open archaeological sites, definitely just the touristic ones. Um, there's one that I always go back to that is in Lima um, that I mean, well, no, actually, let me change my my answer. I just I just thought about another one. It's called White Gun. It's called Waikan, and it's off of the um, of the central um, central highway in Lima, and it's such a huge complex. I mean, if you've been to Pachacamac, that is the most known complex in Lima. You you go to Waikan and you go like, why isn't this popular enough that people will see it all the time? Now there are some neighbors uh, of. Uh, Waikan that are making it popular, that are making it renowned, that are taking care of the Waka. Unfortunately, there, there's always going to be a lack of resources that are sent to all of the diversity because one of the main problems of having so much history is that you won't have enough resources to protect them all. So there are initiatives and I, I'm really looking forward what they do with Waikan Cultural, uh, that is the organization that, that is protecting the Waikan a complex, so uh, I'm excited about that. I just wanted to drop a cherry on them because they're they're excellent. 
No, oh, that's great. I've actually seen Wycon myself. I went a few years ago and I found it a really interesting site as well. I believe it was used as like a, an Incan kind of administration site, um, partially. And it has a lot of really interesting like symbolism in some of the architecture as well. And I, I, I hope that as well that it, that it continues to grow in popularity and in the places like that, because they're still being found. <laughs> New places like that are still being found today. And so I hope that they continue to be protected as they should that's be. That's something so that, that, that is really important to point out, you know, Again, uh, Peruvian archaeology, as opposed to the other uh, cradles of civilization, is the, the youngest uh, with investigations. So you're constantly hearing about new discoveries on the news, which makes it more interesting for us, but it's also hard to keep up with all of it. Um, so it's always nice to have people coming back to Peru and seeing more and more things that were just discovered. Definitely, definitely. I completely agree. Um, Mike would like to know that he uh, he sees some interesting handles on the pottery, and he's wondering if the unique design um, means anything particular. Ooh, that's a that's a long answer for <laughs> for a question. Let's we put it this time. way: <laughs> <laughs> most of them, I mean, most of the objects that we have. Well, not really most, but a lot of the objects that we have at the museum and most of the examples that you've seen in the presentation are um, from the coast. So we have two, two very specific styles in the in the coast and they do have a symbolism to them. I'm not going to go over them because it is quite long and it is not uh, it's it's still not um, available by, by every archaeologist and investigator. So they all have their different opinions, but we'll let's talk about vessels in general. Vessels are, I mean, and, and one of the most important things that we need to know about Andean Cosmovision is that we need fluids, right? Um, I mean, in nature, we have fluids that are constantly running and they are an important part of the development of, of the world and of life. And so, to have that powerful symbolism of containing fluids or even just having the vessel that contains them is important. And so of course the handles that we have in those vessels will probably have a connection to them. One of the theories that, that we handle at the museum is that I really, really love. Now I'm not sure if that's gonna be the correct one because we would have to you know, research it for 10 more years um, is the, the acts of having that duality as you put in the liquid. You have a handle that is capable of getting the fluid inside, but then the air coming out of the other side. So it's the duality mm -hmm. of the elements. Um, I mean, that's just one of them. Uh, so again, it's a very long answer, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point it became a big in um, a very specific meaning to the handles that were applied in the vessels. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I, I would be super curious to see what some of the other uh, theories are. And, you know, maybe in 10 years, we'll have an answer. <laughs> That's great. Um, Sandra says, uh, do people in Peru still use some of the old techniques to make this type of pottery or were they lost in time? She also says, thanks for the session. Very interesting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, there are traditions that continue on. I mean, you can see it in any trip to Peru. They will show you the way that they did textiles. They will show you the way that they did pottery. Lost for 100%, they are not. Maybe they will be modernized a little bit. Maybe some of them will be just for uh, the fact that they are keeping on with some tradition. What will be lost though, it's most of its ceremonial uh, meaning, right? So, um, so the ceremonial meaning will have been, um, uh, the, there, there's, a, there's a process, right, of when the Spanish people came over here and became, it, it became a syncretism that is basically the mesh of the religions, that is the Andean cosmovision and the gods that they had with uh, Christianity um, and Catholicism eventually, right? So, um, so a lot of these objects will have uh, meaning that it's more social now as a community, but they will still have some techniques that are left over, of course, from, and it's always nice to see them, especially with textile workers, which is quite a big thing. 
um, to have that and know that it came from 3000 years ago is fascinating. I completely agree. And the textiles in Peru are very impressive. I definitely recommend anybody that comes here to spend some extra time <laughs> trying to, to see some textiles and to even buy some textiles with those ancient patterns today as well. Um, we have some, a few more questions, so I'm just going to continue going. Uh, we have one from Edgar on Facebook. Uh, he would like to know um, if there are, if you're offering promotional prices for students um, coming to the Museo Larco from Lima, um, if there's any kind of special rates for, for Peruvians who come to, to see the museum. I mean, the, the, I would say that there's a student rate. So yeah, there is a student rate. Although I would have, I do have to make a disclaimer here and say that the museum is closed for now. So uh, we're, still, we're still hoping that this pandemic will pass over so we'll finally get to open again because we do miss it. I can imagine. Yeah, I'm hopefully in the next few months, you guys will be able to reopen your doors for guests and we can start recommending people to come there again as well. For sure. Um, a few other questions is, does Pacha mean earth surface? Yes, it means, it means earth. But again, it's, uh, I didn't want to go over that because, uh, Quechua, I'm just starting to learn Quechua and the fact that there's such a metaphysical way to what the words are is just startling, you know, because it was a language that was transmitted orally. And so to have that as the earth is not containing the full message of what a pacha, mean, what pacha means, you know, it can mean earth. It can also mean, I would say that it's almost like a dimension really uh but yeah in the most basic of terms it would be translated as earth that's fascinating yeah quechua is a really interesting language and i i love hearing it whenever i'm traveling around in peru um, what uh from jane would like to know uh what other metals did the incas use other than gold and silver did they have bronze oh so there was um the, the main things that they used was gold, sil silver, and copper. So copper was actually quite used. In that vessel that I showed you, there's actually, I, I mean, you, you need to have an alloy with the copper in order to make gold um, less malleable and less soft. So you always have copper with it. Um, that would be the third main one. They make the, the best blend for those materials, especially with the ones like the one that I showed that it's half silver, half gold, uh, in order to make it be able to stick, you would need uh, physically that. That's really interesting. I, I believe that I, I heard as well that a lot of times, you know, you see something gold um, and from the Inca times and it might not be completely gold. They had like ways to manipulate the metal to where the gold would show out on the outside layer and maybe the copper would be underneath. Yeah, metal work is amazing when you think about um, ancient cultures, especially, I mean, there, there, are, there are a couple of cultures here that were specifically really, really good at metal work. And yeah, you never, you don't really know how much of a percentage of, of gold it is because you will see it like the one that, that I showed you at the, at the end and you will go like, whoa, this is, this is like 100% gold, but it really isn't. Um, because they don't, and that's, that's another difference that we have with the way that we see the world. We put a price on how much gold there is on a piece, but they didn't really care about the gold as a material. They cared about the meaning behind it. As long as it shines, it represents what they, what they want to represent. It represents how much the sun shines. And when you wear it, you have that sunshine on you. And so it's a good representation. And it doesn't really matter how much gold you put, because if you're really good at metal work, the, no one else will ever know that how much copper you've added to it. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really, really fascinating to see some of these pieces in person. And I definitely recommend, once again, going to the Larco Museum when you're here, um, whenever you, you know, once travel is safe again, and checking out some of these pieces in person. Um, we have a few more questions before we sign off. Um, 
Lisa would like to know uh, the bird, cat, and snake symbols that are found in a lot of the pottery and, and different kinds of artifacts. Are they common to many of the cultures that you referenced? Yes. <laughs> I, I took a very general direction in a, uh, I mean, with intentionally, because most of the cultures will have these. They will have the representation of different kinds of birds. Of course, we're talking about different cultures that existed in different places. And so you're not going to see a condor in the, I mean, in the coast, for example, right? Um, and you're not going to see a jaguar in the coast either. So, uh, I mean, well, let, let's let's say let's let's go over the rest. Um, so birds, uh, felines, and reptiles and snakes are going to change depending on where you're at. But they're mostly going to be that because it's what's logically there, right? You will have birds to, that represent the the Hanan Bacha, and then you will have reptiles or underground beings that represent the world underneath. And of course, the strongest one, we didn't have birds, we didn't have lions, we had felines. So those are the ones that represent their world too. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, BB is curious about the expressions on the objects that appear mythological. Um, I know that some of them, yeah, kind of have kind of kind of godlike figures. I wonder if you'd like to speak about that for a moment. Well, okay, so <laughs> those same expressions that we have, I mean, we have different kinds of ornaments and, um, and we have different kinds of um, expressions of animals in the bodies, in the faces mostly, of governors or people from the elite or representations of heroes and gods. And so it's a very broad subject to cover, but uh, you will almost always have a specific symbolism of something that is over your world. You know, if you belong in the world now, I mean, we are in this world, right? In the, in, in the Gai Pacha, we live in the world now. But if we have some kind of symbol of the Hanan Pacha, like let's say a bird in our headdress, you know, we will be a little bit over that gap of we not only cover this world, but we cover both worlds. And so um, there are, I mean, just the symbols and the items that we see, they needed to have it as a way of communicating you know, because that was their way that they would present to the world. There was no need to go over people and say, hey, I'm important. You know, you just tell it by the way that you dress. It's so it's the way that we do it now, too. It's just that it's more subtle now. Right. But then it was very important to keep that elite system and to keep that society. And so you have that representation physically that people are able to see. So it was very important to have it on the way that you dressed and on the way that you did things and then the things that you used or and how you were buried too. I don't know if that answered the question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, um, I think that answered it perfectly. Um, we just have just a few more. Um, so Lynn would like to know if we will be or if you will be putting any of the items up for a virtual visit to Larco while we are unable to visit. I believe you Ooh, guys already we, have some. Mm -hmm. We do. <laughs> so you can actually see it if you go into our website uh, that it's museolarco.org. You can see um, the virtual tour through there. It's a 360 tour. You can see the permanent exhibition. You will see the storage, which I haven't shown much of, but the storage is quite impressive because it's all of the things that we don't have in the permanent exhibition. And then you can even see the gardens in the cafe and while well, our very well-known uh, erotic gallery too, for those who are curious about it. I will leave the Museo Larco um, website in the chat for everyone really quickly in case you would like to, to look that more deeply. Um, so just a few more questions. Um, let's see. Okay, so one of the last ones is how do you spell Waikan, which was oh. the archeological site. <laughs> H-U-A-Y-C-A-N, mm -hmm. Waikan. Waikan. It's also the name of the place of the of the district itself. So, mm -hmm. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. And our last question, um, we'll try to keep this brief because it's kind of a big question, but just to get your, your ideas, Brennan would like to know what are your thoughts on how the crucible started in Peru? Of how what? Sorry? How the, the crucible and the, the arrival of the Spanish and the, like the spreading of Christianity in, in Peru. How it happened? That's just what are your general thoughts? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I've never been asked that question. That's an interesting question. It's also it's also a very big one. Uh, my Definitely. particular thoughts on it. I mean, um, let's say this that as as someone who has had a passion for history and archaeology, for me, what's done is done. You know, if you thought of, if you think about my, if, if, if someone wants to know about my thoughts of history, it happened. <laughs> That's the thing. It happened. So it's our chance to study what were the um, what were the connections that were made, what was the, what were the things that were left behind. And what we still have until now without knowing it. And I think that's the most important thing of us because there's a there's no us without them, if you know what I mean. So we are still an evolution and a product of that blending happening and that syncretism happening. And so our traditions are now a mix of everything that came afterwards. And we are so proud of those traditions, which is an odd thing, you know, uh, considering all of the things that happened before. But that is the way that it is. And Peru is the blend of ancient traditions with the arrival of the Spanish and all of the other influences that came after them. Um, let's, um, I mean, for me personally, my, my father's side comes from the slaves, and my mom's side comes from the Indian people that can, that were uh, mixed in with the Spanish. So there's literally no me without that happening. So I I get that the con the conquista and all of these processes are just there for us to study and for us to see and for us to really understand that it happened and that we can continue on those processes and we can still see them until now. And that's the important thing, that we can see things that survived too and that stayed on, like the traditions that we have. That was really beautifully said, Sam. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate you that's um, taking the time to answer all these questions for us. That's about all the time that we have for the for today. Uh, so thank you again um, on behalf of Inca Expert Travel and Proof for Less. We are so appreciative that you joined us today um, and shared some of your knowledge. And, and hopefully we can do this again in the future. Oh, thank you for having me, Karen. And, and thank you all for coming. We really hope that everything um, gets better soon so you can all come back and come to Peru and come explore it not really just for me or from Kiranen or from everyone there but for yourselves it's a it's such a nourish it's such a nourishment to our souls really just to visit Peru and to understand it so hopefully you'll be here soon Yes, we hope we hope so. Thank you so much again, everyone. And thanks again, Sam. I would also like to thank our hosts again for allowing us to share this space together. Uh, Proof for Less and Inca Expert Travel, if you're looking to plan a trip in the future, um, I would definitely recommend either of these agencies. Uh, a big thank you for everyone who joined us on both Facebook and Zoom. We hope you enjoyed learning about the mystic motifs of the ancient Andes with Samantha and Galala in our Passport to Peru lecture series. Be sure to sign up for the next lecture with uh, the founder of Awamaki, Kennedy Levins, about the artisan traditions of the Sacred Valley. That will be next Thursday, February 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful evening.